Well, let's uh, let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter eight, would you? Romans chapter eight. Our text tonight will be Romans eight fifteen through twenty one. Just what six verses? Not a long, long section of the Bible. Um, as you turn there, please please note that there's Bibles all over. You can use one if you'd like, an orange or a yellow. Please put your eyes on God's word. Don't just take my word for it. Uh, we've been studying uh, the book of Romans. The book of Romans was written by Paul, and it was in a time uh, during the Roman Empire known as the Pax Romana, and it was a peaceful time in the Roman Empire, if there really was one. Uh, what I mean by that is that there wasn't a whole lot of conquering going on at this time. <clears throat> that they had done a lot of conquering already, so there wasn't a lot of conquering going on right now. But he wrote this letter uh, to a group of <clears throat> mixed, a mixed bag, okay? A... Um, it was, a, it was a bunch of Jewish people, and it was a bunch of Gentiles, and they all had their own belief systems. He's bringing it all together. He's saying, this is Christianity. This is the gospel. Let's get on track. Okay, so he wrote, writes this letter. Now, we understand, uh, when we went all the way back to Romans 1, all the way forward, we understood what the gospel was. Uh, we understood who could get it, how do you get it, what it means, all that stuff. Um, but unfortunately, all too often, the gospel is a very basic thing. It's an evangelistic tool. I kind of... I remember um, I went to this class to teach uh, the gospel, and, and the, the guy gave me this. I wish I had it with me tonight. I thought about it when I was on my way here. I, I should have just gone home and grabbed it. It's called the Evangicube. Anyone ever see one of those? An Evangicube? It's, it's, it's kind of a neat little thing, but it's, it's the size of a Rubik's Cube. Yeah? Do you guys know what a Rubik's Cube is? Okay, some of you are old enough to remember it, right? <laughs> But it's the size of a Rubik's Cube, and, 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 and what you do is, on every side of it, and it opens and moves, it's like a transformer cube, and in it is the story of Jesus, and the story of us, and how we, we're, we started this way, and then we sinned, and then this, and then this, and Jesus is the only way back, if not, you're in hell, it's like the devil, it looks like, you know, it's terrible, but they broke it down, and they boiled it down into this simple little cube, which is cool to get the point across, and I think that if we went upstairs and asked any of our kids upstairs, you know, what, what is the gospel? I won't ask Noodle, right? I won't ask Noodle what the gospel is. He knows, but he didn't. Mary told me a couple weeks ago that, what is the gospel? Like, he knows. He didn't know it was called the gospel, right? But, but, but if you ask one of those kids up there, and, 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 and any one of them said, you know what? The gospel is this, that, that I've not done things that Jesus wants me to. I've been naughty. I've misbehaved. I've broken his rules. And I'm, I'm a mess up. And, and, but Jesus isn't. He's perfect. And, and he's God's son. And, he's, and he went to the cross. And he got put up on the cross to pay for my sins so that I don't have to go to hell. I get to go to heaven. Now, if any of our kids say that, right there upstairs, would, I'd commend that kid, right? That would be awesome. Right? And, and that's tr because it's true. It's just not the fullness of the gospel. It's not the fullness of the gospel. It's not all that there is. And what Paul's doing here in the book of Romans is telling us that it's not just a one-time deal that you share with someone and so they can go from lost to saved, from darkness to light, from, from death to life, that there's more than that. It's not just an evangelistic tool to get someone who is lost saved. Although it is that, there's so much more. And what Paul's trying to tell us in the book of Romans is that there's some residual effect to the gospel that God has deposited into the life of the one who first accepted it and bowed his knee to Christ as Lord and Savior. He got saved, and that's awesome. And on that day, things change for that person, but there's some residual effect to the gospel. The gospel saved us. But it goes on and continues to save us continually as we live. And so that is what you see here in our text tonight. I want to share it with you. And so let's do that. We're in Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start at verse 15. We're only going to read, I guess, six verses. Y'all there? Amen. Paul, are you there? No chance. <laughs> So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. 
In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share His glory, we must also share His suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who His children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We were given this hope when we were saved. And then there's some parentheses. Mm, not sure. I'm going to read it to you. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Now listen. I need the gospel to have residual effect in my life. I know he saved me. I know that one day I'm going to be with him in glory. I get it. But I need the gospel in my life in a residual way. Y'all know how many kids we have. Right? <laughs> and just rips it right out of her head. Like, how, where did he learn that? I, I never taught him that. Mary, could you fix me some dinner? No. Like, I didn't model that behavior. That's just who he is. But we've got all this stuff in the house. And I've got a 21-year-old daughter who has a son, Keegan. And Keegan is a sweet little boy. They just, you know, her and her... Her boyfriend just, they broke up, and there's tension there, and, you know, she's upset about that, and, you know, it's just, there's a lot of stuff to have to deal with in our life, and, and the gospel needs to speak to my marriage, so that I can appreciate Meredith and treat her well, and, and know how to serve her, because I, you know what, even if she doesn't deserve something, I should still do it anyway. Why? Because that's what Jesus did for me. And so when I reflect on what he did for me when I didn't deserve it, it makes it so much easier to, to wait hand and foot on a woman that may not des deserve it at that very moment. 
And maybe she needs it to speak to her. The gospel needs to be very, very present in her life because maybe there's times when I just, and I admit it, like, you don't want to go into my bedroom and see all my clothing on the floor. I just admit it. I'm an absolute slob. I, that's just my thing. I don't know. Now's not a good time for a guy to raise his hand and join me in this, but I'm, I, on my side of the bed, there's a full wardrobe. If you ever need some pants, just come to my house. They're all on the floor right there. And she never says a word. That's the gospel at work in a woman's heart. It needs to deal with a wretched man like myself. That's just the way it is. The gospel needs to be there. How else do you deal with a teenager who is driving you absolutely crazy? It's the gospel. Send them to Cindy. <laughs> I like it. You've got to have the gospel to deal with Michael, right? No, oh, I didn't even know. Was that my? I, I said that out loud. Hey, I can cut you off. No, I'm just kidding. Stupid stuff. You're good. You're good. We we need we we need the gospel. Now in this section of scripture, it talks about oh, the father, daddy. You know what I'm saying? That that the residual thing, like God. And, and the Father has deposited some things in you as a result of this gospel, of what Jesus did for you. It's not just a one-time deal. Now, I'm going to say this. Before we dive into this section of Scripture, I understand that not everybody had a really good dad. You know? I had a really, honestly, a crappy dad. Um, never home. Didn't provide well at all. And ended up just shacking up with his high school girlfriend after being married for 25 years and running around. Like, that's not the best dad ever, right? Okay, so I understand that not everybody has a good dad, but God is, God's a really good dad. And, and I think that's what he's trying to teach us here tonight. Now listen, there's one thing I do know about my kids, and, and if you're a parent, you know this. I don't know why, but if I'm sitting in the living room and Jackson's there, he just likes to climb up on my lap. Do you know what I'm saying? Does baby just like to climb on your lap? You know, it's really, really weird. Does Landon do that too? He just wants to climb on your lap. You know what it is with, 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 with Jackson, though? It's weird. Like, there's something behind me, isn't there? Can you see it? Because he's always climbing up on my lap and he's trying to get to that thing. But there's nothing there. But he never, he's never satisfied with his height. He always tries to make one more step up. That he's trying to get to something. But there's nothing there. I don't know what it is. I've noticed two things about kids. One, they love to climb on your lap because they just like to be close. They just like to feel safe. They need to feel loved. They need to feel secure, right? And the other thing that they like to do, I don't know if it's, if it's just my kids, but all my kids, always, they just want you to, they just want you to watch. Right? Daddy, watch me beat Mario. Like, that's going to affect the race in any way, right? If you watch him, soup, like, I don't know, Luigi, or whatever his name is, will go faster if you watch the game. They just want, want, Daddy, watch this, and they're just drawing a picture. Daddy, watch how up as I ride my bike. Daddy, watch as I play this game. Daddy, watch as I do this dance, and, the, and Adriana will come out with Elizabeth or, or, or Serenity, and they'll, they'll dance, and they'll sing. They'll come out of the room, and that's what they'll do. That's what they'll do. They just want you to watch. They just want to know that you love them, know that you care, know that you'll listen, know that you watch. They just want to feel loved and safe and secure, and not everybody had that dad. I did not have that dad, so I am encouraged when I read this. He's done four things, and I want to point them out. They're all right here in the short text, okay? The first thing that God does as a result of the gospel is that he changes your identity. Now you'll see it right there in the text. Look at verse 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own Children, now we call him, and let's just say what it is. Now we call him Daddy. See, what he's telling us here is that, is that as a result of the gospel, you don't have to be afraid of God. Like, you should fear him because he's the one who spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. And we see in the scripture, he can bring famine and death and snake bites and Ananias and Sapphira that did wrong. And boom, he strikes them dead. Like, he, he, he is tough as nails, and we should fear him. But we don't have to come to him anymore as a fearful person who just says, ah, don't hurt me. See, a lot of people have that idea of God that he's just this big killjoy 
a, a fun sucker in the sky who doesn't want you to have any joy. And if you mess up, you're done. And that's really not the way it is. See, as a child that doesn't belong to a dad, you can't just go up to someone's house and just show up, walk in, put your feet up, and start eating. In Lake County, you're ch -ch -ch when someone does that, right? You can't just do that. So there's a di I would be scared to walk into a home and just help myself to their refrigerator, right? That could be a problem. But we don't have to be that way anymore. He's given us a new identity. He's adopted us in by choice to allow you to come in and have refrigerator rights at his house. You can come in, no problem, put your feet up, grab some ramen noodles, and eat away. Amen. Amen. I was just trying to make up for what I did to you. Just yeah, a I hope ago. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now what it says here, it, this needs to be addressed. It says that we're his children. Okay? It says that we're his children. Now, this, this is something that I, I just kind of want to cross this bridge. In, in, in today's Christian world, when you share the gospel with people, you will find this response often when they want to say no. We're all God's children. We're all God's children, right? But I've got to tell you something. No, you're not. Not everyone's God's children. You're God's creation. Yes. But you're not. Not everyone is God's child. Look at the text. Remember what it says here, okay? I'm just coming at you with the Bible. You've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now, we call him dad. Okay? So, not everybody is God's child. The Bible tells us very, very different. Some different news for people that think that everyone is God's child. Okay? First and foremost, our old identity was found in Ephesians 2.1. That we were dead men. That you were a dead man walking. You just existed because of your evil thoughts and actions. That you were a dead man walking, you were just existing, but you were not a child of God, you were actually a dead man. Colossians 1.21 said that not only were you a dead man, but you were a dead man walking as his enemy. That you were pushing back on God, and he was pushing back on you, and you were claiming things as your own, taking credit for it when you didn't deserve it. You were worshiping the creation, anything other than him, in opposition to what he has said to do. You were his enemy, and you were a dead man walking. Now, you can't consider yourself a child of God when the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.3 that the people who have not accepted Christ are not children of God. They're children of His wrath. They're children of His wrath. Now, again, I don't know exactly what wrath is, but I certainly don't want to find out. I don't want to fight Him. Now, we are children of His wrath, but now, see, the Bible tells us we have a new identity. We've been adopted in as a child of God. I mean, now we're not a dead man. Now we're not his enemy. Now we're not a children, a child of wrath. Now we are God's masterpiece. We read on in Ephesians that told us we were children of wrath before. But in that same chapter in 2.10, it says that we are now God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ to do the good works that he had planned for us to do originally. See, we were originally made in God's image to be like him, to worship him. And the, and the sin of mankind fractured all that, messed it all up, and we didn't do that anymore. But now, since we're new in Christ, now we can do the things He has planned for us to do from times past. It also says in Romans 8.15, we're kind of jumping to another, um, I'm sorry, yeah, that's our text tonight. It says that we are adopted child of God. And also in Romans 5.11, it says that we are friends of God. So see, God has given us a new identity. We are a child of God, where we are welcomed into the house. We will not be shunned, we will not be thrown away, we will not hear, shh, shh, shh. You're welcomed in, and we're also his friend. Now, when you think about these two things, a child of God and a friend of God, what do those two things tell you? What do they say to you? Family. family. Let me ask you a question. When, when it's a family member or a good friend, Love. what do you want to do with them? Hang out? Do you want to hang out with them, right? Do you want to talk to them? You want to play sports with them? You want to puke on them? You want them to puke on you? You want to rejoice with them? You want them to rejoice with you? You want to spend time with them? You want to tell them your worries and problems and doubts? And God's like, listen, I'm your friend. I'm your father. I want you to curl up on my lap. Feel free to come up on my lap and share your doubts and your worries and your fears and your successes and your questions and your concerns with me. I'm not going to hurt you. 
Don't be afraid of me anymore. I'm your loving daddy. You're not my enemy anymore. I'm not fighting against you anymore. I'm welcoming you in. Come on up on my lap and let's hang out and let's talk. Let's spend some time together. What do friends do? What do you do with your friends? Cards. What's that? Talk. What else? Play cards? Eat crawfish friends. Eat. <laughs> 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 I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> you spend time with them, right? You hang out. You're buddies. You share life's experiences with your friends and your family members. And what God's saying here is that when you said yes to Jesus, He didn't just save you from an eternity in hell. He brought you into a new relationship. You're now my son. And you're my friend. And I just want to hang out with you. We over-spiritualize it. And, and sometimes when we have these, uh, these, these, these highly religious prayers... Right? It takes away from this. I mean, how do you have a friend? Would you go to your friend and, and use King James? Who would use King James with a friend? Rome. Who would King, use King James with their dad? Rome. Yeah. It's on King James. Ain't even lying. It's on King James. Love you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you're a strong. People don't realize that. This is this big disconnect between, you know, normal life and then religious, church, Christian, Bible-believing life that somehow everything has to change, even to the point where your language has to change with God. Like, you can't just be his friend and talk to him and spend time with him and share your doubts about him with him, right? If you're a real friend, if we're real friends, you can tell me something, I can tell you something. It's not going to offend you so much if we sever our relationship. We should, if we're real friends, we can talk. Right? And that's what God's saying here to us. That we're now a new person. No longer a dead man. No more fighting against God. No more a child of wrath. But now you're my masterpiece. Created anew in Christ. My adopted child. You can come to me anytime. You have refrigerator lights. Okay, so here's the second thing that God does. He gives, he gives us confidence. Look here in verse 16. He says, For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Now, the word affirm means this. It means to state a fact, but it also, the second part of the definition also carries this, that it carries with the fact this encouragement and emotional support. So in other words, when, this, when, when the immaterial portion of who I am comes in contact with the immaterial portion of who God is, not God in the flesh, not God the creator that's, that you can see the stuff he made, but just who he is, his spirit. When it contacts with us, and we come together, a fact is stated. The fact is, you are my son. But along with that, it carries with it this emotional support, this encouragement. In other words, you're going to feel. You're going to sense it, that he is now your daddy. He is now your daddy. That you don't have to fear him anymore. You've got to move and transition into that relationship with him. Because that's exactly what it is. You're going to feel confident. Now, what are some of the things that we can feel confident about about our daddy? Can daddy, can daddy, daddies are supposed to provide for their families. Would you agree? That's kind of like one of our main jobs, provide for your family. Okay, so let's, let's look here for a second. Provision, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Go there for a moment. So what, what we do is we're just kind of comparing our earthly fathers with this heavenly father, okay? And, and, and listen, don't judge your heavenly father by what your earthly father necessarily did. You may have had an awesome dad, and that's great, okay? And, and, and maybe we are going to be that awesome dad, okay? That's, that's what we're not, we need to pursue, but don't compare, don't say this is what my dad was, so I can't, I can't relate to God the Father because he's not the same, okay? Look at Matthew 6, 31 through 33 when it talks to about provision a dad will provide. It says here, Jesus, in red, he says this, don't worry about these things, what things? Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear, right? These things are the things that daddies provide for their families, right? So what does it say? It says these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. 
They dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything that you need. See, He already knows what you need. And if you'll just make His kingdom the most important thing and put your trust in Him, He will take care of all of your needs. We don't need to worry ourselves sick about what we're going to eat. These are the basic necessities of life is what he's talking about, right? And he says, I'm going to take care of the needs of your family if you'll make pursuing me and my kingdom and making me known to the world your most important thing. Just worship me the way I've told you to worship me and I'll take care of your food, your clothing, your housing. I've got this, right? Now, earthly dads are supposed to do the same thing. We're supposed to take care of those things. But see, all too often, earthly dads take this to heart so much that that's all they do. That they work so much providing that they cease being daddy. And they cease being hubby. They're just providers. Okay? And that's not the way God is. See, God is way different so, because along with this promise to provide for your needs, he also says all through scripture, you guys all know this is not a secret, he says I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, Jesus himself in the commission said I will be with you till the end of the age. His promise is that not only will I provide for you, but I'm not going to leave the house where you are and go off to work and just take care of your needs and leave you hanging wondering what, what I like and just see me as a paycheck. That's not the way God is. God says, I will provide for your needs, but I will also be there for you for the other purposes of what a dad is supposed to do. Not just a paycheck. Not just a paycheck. Now, let me have to admit, and I'm guilty of this often, that sometimes daddy is home, but there ain't nobody home. Can we be honest? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm guilty of it. You know, they just want to come up. Like I said, Jackson just wants to curl up on my lap. But I can't because I've got to get one more text in to Kyle about the set. Or, or you know what I'm saying? Or, or I, got, I have to read one more. I'm almost done, Jameson. Just hold up. You're like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm doing my job right here. But isn't it just as important to make sure that I give her my ear? To give her my... She just wants me to watch. Right? We've already talked about it. She just wants me to watch her play the week. Somehow that magnifies the experience for her and it bonds us together that I'm, I'm there with her. And, 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 and unfortunately, often I fall victim. I say, you know what, I'm just, I'm kind of busy right now. It's so bad, and I'm just feeling awful, <laughs> that, that Jameson now makes fun of me and says, you're busy? And she says that. That's bad, like that's nothing to laugh about. Seriously, that's nothing to laugh about. That's horrible. You know what I'm saying? Like, you guys can't be more important. You know, this can't be more important than my own little girl. But she is now saying, you're too busy? Like, obviously, how did she get that? Because that's my answer way too often. And I can't be that way. And God's promise is like, no, I'm not going to be that guy. Like, I'm going to provide for you. Don't worry. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things shall be provided unto you. But also, 1 John 5, 14, of the character of God, it says that we are confident that God hears us. We come to him and talk to him. He's listening. He's not some far off God that's just off punching the clock at the factory, just providing for you, making sure that there's wheat, and making sure that there's cows, and making sure that there's chickens. And making sure that this wood for your house, to make sure the sun to grow all that. He's not just doing that. While he's doing that, he's also, he's right there listening. That's his promise. That's his promise. So we're confident that he hears us. I love the fact that they use the word confident in scriptures, because that's what we're talking about. There's other things that he builds our confidence in. You know, Psalm 46, 1, it says he's an ever-present help in trouble. Who's ever been in trouble? Any kind of trouble, right? You're in trouble. You need some help with something. And I'm not talking about just like someone's getting ready to beat you up. You know, I'm, I'm talking about any type of trouble. God says, I'm an ever-present help in trouble. That means I'm always there. It's just another way of him saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm right here with you. 
Now, how does he go about doing this? When he says you have an ever present help in trouble, everyone's trouble is different, right? So we need help in a different way. So what, what, sometimes, sometimes he just allows that thing to come into your life and it just crushes you and you get ticked and you want to you want to fight back and you want to fix the problem. And he's like, mm, I'm trying to do something here. Vengeance is mine. See, sometimes his help and your trouble comes later. It'll pay back what was taken from you. He will. We don't have to go take care of stuff ourselves. Sometimes that's the ever-present help in time of trouble. Sometimes he just keeps back a little bit and says, hey, listen, I got this. And we have to trust in him that he will do that. But sometimes, and this, this, this stuff right here, this is awesome. Sometimes he doesn't hold back and say, hey, I'll get him in the back end. Sometimes he's like, I need to do me a favor. Just sit over there, watch me work. No, you don't need to. He says, if God says it, you should. But if I say it, you should. If he, sometimes he says, you just sit over there and watch me work. And he actually, if you've got troubles, he fights your battle for you. You ready for some Lord of the Rings stuff? Yeah. You ready? Okay, well, let's, 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 let's do this. Do, do me a favor, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This stuff, I was reading this this week, it was like, woo! This is awesome! Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, right? In, 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 the, old, in the Old Testament, in these books, 1st uh, and 2nd Kings and Chronicles, uh, that's all they do is kill everybody, right? Uh, you got a new king, don't like him, let's kill him. And I don't like you, so I'm going to kill you. There's wars after war after war after war. New king, new king. You're a king, I'm a king. Everybody is king, king. Right? It's constantly changing. It's totally insane. They're all nuts back then. It's completely convinced of this. And here we are again in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And there's another battle about to begin. Another battle about to begin. And so uh, there's, this, this, uh, there's a lot of names in here. If I mess them up, just you know, bear with me. Okay? But there's this one guy... It says that in chapter uh, 20, verse 13, it says, All the men of Judah were standing before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children. It's about to be a battle. And there's this massive army coming against them. You've seen the movies, right? You've seen the movies. It's a Braveheart moment. You know? And they're all lined up. They used to do it like crazy. They just line up and they just charge you. You've seen the movies. It's insanity. There's no thinking. They just go like crazy people. And the last man standing is sliced and diced. Last man standing, they're the winners. And that's what's about to go down right here. So the whole, all the men of Judah stood there before the Lord with their kids and their wives, their babies. It says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon this one guy, okay? And he starts to talk. He says this, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Ever present help in time of trouble, ready? Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Okay, I got that, right? So he's going to help us win. I'm going to pull my sword, you're going to pull your sword, but I got God on my side, so I'm going to slice and dice you, and I'm going to win. You guys tracking with me on that one? And that's the way I would think about it, right? But let's just read it. Let's see what it says. Don't be discouraged. The battle's not yours, but, the, but, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. Okay, so obviously we're going to fight. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Now that's when I start getting a little bit like confused. Like, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. You, you're going to send us out. I know you said that we're going to win, right? But, but you, and you want us to go face them, but we're not even going to have to fight. I don't even understand what's going to happen here. Okay? He says you will not have to even fight. Take your positions... Then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Now, at that point, I'm confused. If I'm the general re leading this army, I'm like, okay, you want us to go out there to, to face this army, and you don't want us to fight? We're going to get slaughtered, dude. Right? But, but that would be me. I would be totally like confused, afraid. I'd run. I would run. I would run. Okay? And, but let's just read on. Then, then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, and they began to worship 
the Lord. I'm sorry, but at that point, I probably wouldn't be worshiping the Lord. I would be running in the opposite direction, like a scary cat. Then the Levites, which were like the priests, you know, from the clans of Koath and Korah, stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. Now, here's the battle plan, ready? After consulting the people, the king appointed Kyle, Jamie, Candy, and Jessica to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. That's his plan. That was his plan. You want us to put the, the, the worship band in front of the, of the army? Are you kidding me? This is, what, this is what God wants them to do. Now listen to this. This is insane. So we started singing. Thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. That was a terrible effort. If you're going to do it, do it. At the very moment they began to sing, and I'm sure it wasn't as pathetic as that was just now. It probably has some authority behind it, right? At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. They started killing themselves. They were killing themselves, right? This is insane. <laughs> After they had destroyed the army, they began attacking each other. They didn't have to do anything except trust him. And sing praises to him. When you have troubles, right? When the ocean's this deep and the army's right here in front of your face like a wall, like, like locusts as far as the eye can see. Sing praises to God and worship and trust him. He's like, I'm going to battle. And they started killing each other. And they never had to pull the sword out of a sheath. Ever. That's insane, right? Does anyone else think that's cool? Yeah. They should make a movie about that. They should make a movie about the Exodus. I'm telling you, man. I'm thinking Charlton Heston, right? I'm thinking Yul Brenner. I'm I, seriously, right? So let it be written, so let it be done. Listen, Exodus chapter 14. Isn't that weird? Like I would do the Yul Brenner when I'm up. Okay. So anyway, uh, Exodus 14, right? This is awesome. At, go to Exodus 14. Same thing. This is God who says, I'm an ever-present help in time of trouble. Like, sometimes I'll just fight your battle for you. You don't have to do nothing. So you all know the setting here, right? Israel, Israel just leads Egypt, 400 years of bondage. They got like, 2 million people. Moses is leading them across the desert. And they get to the Red Sea. They have nowhere to go. They look behind them. And there's Pharaoh with his army with all these chariots, right? He's like, wait a minute. Did I just let these people go? I'm like crazy. Like, that's... Without them, the whole nation is not like, who's going to be our workforce? Who's, it's, everything is gone. So I saw the, the plagues and the, 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 the lice and the bugs and the locusts and the frogs and the, the Nile turns to blood and, and the kids are dying and the, all that stuff. So I let him go. Then I'm like, what am I doing? So he's like, you know what? I changed my mind. Go get those people. Jack them up. Kill them if you need to. But drag them back here. Let's put them back to work. So they charge after the nation of Israel. Here they are in front of the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. As the Pharaoh approaches, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. Are you with me? I mean, wouldn't you be? Right? Here, comes here come the chariots. Imagine what the sound is of the chariots coming across the desert and you've got the Red Sea in front of you with nowhere to go. So they're panicking. Perfect. I would too. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, this is awesome. Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Like it's his fault. I love that, right? It's never your fault. It's never your fault. It's always believer's fault. Why did you make us leave Egypt? Did he make them leave Egypt? I think they pretty much ran out of Egypt, right? 
with a bunch of gold and silver. Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? No, you didn't. We said, leave us alone. No, you didn't. Let us be the slaves to the Egyptians. No, you didn't. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. <laughs> but Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never, you will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And y'all know what happens, right? All of a sudden, Moses gets up on top of the hill, and he opens up his arms, and the Red Sea opens up, and they walk through us on dry land. And the moment they get through, the Egyptians are coming down, and boom, the water covers them, and every single one of them dies in the Pharaoh. You old Brenner's going, boom, like he's freaking out. God went to battle for them. Ever present help in time of trouble. Do you trust him like, the, like Moses did? Do you trust that he would open up your Red Sea when you have a problem that seems insurmountable before you? God will fight your battle for you if you allow him the opportunity to do so. Okay? So he, he fills us with confidence. He fills us with confidence. Here's the third thing that he does. He, he gives us a new identity. He fills us with confidence. And then he also, um, if he's a daddy, right, he prepares an inheritance for you. Look at uh, our text, verse 17. Since, you, we, are, since we... But, you know, you, since you, since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are his heirs. We are the heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. I'm throwing the suffering thing in there, even though I'm not going to elaborate on it, but I don't want you to think it's all peachy and fine just because you're one of God's children. But he does prepare a place for us, and I wish I could tell you exactly what it's like. I know that people have over history tried their very best to explain to you what it's going to be like. The very best is, is John, you know, Revelation, he's in the streets of gold. And all these I mean, he's trying his best. To, the God gave him this moment where, he, where the veil was open. He got to see what we're going to see. And, and, but he's like, I can't even describe, like, he's doing the best that he can. And as a matter of fact, Paul, who was, uh, according to the scriptures, sucked up somehow to this third heaven. People fight about what that is too. But he saw amazing glory, but he even said in response to that, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind, and Paul had a great mind, right? He wrote half the New Testament. No mind can imagine what God has planned for those who love him. It's going to be amazing, amazing, but I can't describe it to you because I don't know. I've never been there. So I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be like, but I will tell you this, that Jesus said in John 14 that he's going to prepare a place for you. And that there's plenty of room, plenty of room in his father's house. Plenty of room for you, plenty of room for you, plenty of room for Charles, plenty of room for Joe, and plenty of room for everybody. There's plenty of room. And at, at, at some time, and he doesn't even know when, only the father knows, He's going to come back, he's going to grab you, he's going to take you to that amazing place where he's prepared this, what the Bible says, is a priceless inheritance. And it's not that you can't put a price to it, like it's not that it doesn't have monetary value, it's beyond all that. But the reason why it's priceless is because it tells us, we go back to this now, Matthew 6, 20, 1 Peter 1, 4, that, these, that this inheritance that he's prepared for you is beyond the reach of rust and decay. That, that, that weather won't, won't wear it down and make it kind of smooth along the edge. It's going to be sharp and crisp and awesome. And then you know how the, the weather seems to like wear away at the Grand Canyon and the mountains and it changes over time. Listen, your inheritance is priceless because it will not change. That, that, that the, the weather will not take it and diminish it in any way. Time will not diminish it in any way. You're not going to, you know, like we have a, we have, if, if you're lucky enough to have some money in your bank account over time, sometimes it goes do 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 Right? Unfortunately, it's supposed to be going do 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 but most of us are going do 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 Right? <laughs> That's just what's happening. But here, here, this says here, it's a priceless inheritance beyond rust or decay. Time won't diminish it. Weather Conditions won't diminish it, and also nobody can take it away from you. No one is going to cut in line. No one's going to go in there and steal your inheritance. See, these references tell us that, the, no, that in here, in this world, the thief can steal stuff. But there, wherever it is going to be, whether it's this heaven or it's a new heaven and new earth, and theologians talk about that. Whatever it is, he's coming back, 
and its inheritance is priceless. You know why it's priceless? It's the only inheritance known to man that cannot change and will not be taken away by anyone else. It's secure. Amen. Yeah, come on, man, right? That's why it's priceless. No one can take it from you. We know this in the scriptures. There's no more crying. No crying, no sorrow, no pain, and no death. It says, it does say this, that, that when we die, we're going to die, we get this, this corruptible body. Can anyone agree with me on the corruptible body? Like, I woke up, I'm 45 years old, which is not old, right? Yeah. Getting there. <laughs> I, I know what you're going to say, because I, I, there's certain things that you know Michael can't refrain. He just, he has to. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming, bro. It's been long enough. But listen, it's been a while. It's been like a whole 25 minutes. It's cool. Yeah. That's growth. That's spiritual growth. That's maturity. I appreciate that. I'll read Revelation. Pull up your pants. Okay, so. <laughs> 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 that got an amen. All right. Yeah, we're getting somewhere. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I don't even know what we were talking about. I honestly have no idea what we were just talking about. You said you weren't old. Morning, I, I'm 45 years old, honestly. I mean, that's not right? right? Okay, it's like halfway. And I woke up this morning at, at, at 5 30. I could barely walk. Who, who, has, who has this in their vocabulary? Oh, who's got that, right? Afternoon, right? At 5 30 in the morning, I was in such pain in my back, I could barely get out of the bed. You know, and you see Jameson, right? She's too, she's like everywhere. That's what she does, right? That's just the normal speed, right? And we're like, just can I just sit down, please? <laughs> just just don't talk to me. You know, that's like that's what's happened is that we, we heard we got like the other day for some reason all of a sudden my elbow started hurting. No reason. Right? Who's got that? Mystery pain, right? It's insane. What what happened? So but the Bible says that somehow, somewhere that this all over here, which is corruptible, is absolutely falling apart. Can you agree? Absolutely fall. I know it doesn't look it, right? But no, it's absolutely falling apart, right? It does. But but we're going to be. But we're going to have an incorruptible body. That that's the promise of. of that's in the gospel. That someday, because of what Jesus has done to reconcile this relationship, that God's going to give you a new body. That's incorruptible. It's not. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Like, and it's going to be real. Do you guys know, like, you're not going to be cast for the friendly ghost. You know, like, Jesus, when he, when he rose, right, he actually, he was a body that he, they touched him. They felt the, the holes and stuff, but he also walked through walls, which was totally cool. Totally cool. I'm in on that. He was both. Now, I don't even understand that, right? I don't even understand that. We're not going to all look the same. We're not going to have the same, because it says that in the scriptures. We're all going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be better looking than most of you guys. But we're going to have different bodies. Because I got a great start. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. But th that's what's going to happen. We're going to have incorruptible bodies. No tendonitis, right? No arthritis. No cataracts. No heart attacks. No clogged veins and no migraines. Yeah, right? Someday that's just going to happen. That's part of this fullness of the gospel. That someday, that's your inheritance. That someday the children of God will be revealed and you will receive your full inheritance as a child of God. And that's part of it. But will the, will the streets be gold? Like literally gold? Or, I don't know, man. I don't know. I've never been there. But I do know that my body is going to be incorruptible. And I do know that I'm not going to cry anymore. Which you all know I need help with that. Right? I'm not going to cry anymore. That someday everything that you want, you know, you, you know when you go, man, I wish that, yeah, that's going to be. No more crying. No more pain. Yeah. <laughs> Both bookends right here, yeah. You won't feel like you're on fire anymore. You won't, be, you won't feel like your back just got ripped out of your body. I mean, you won't feel like your head's going to explode anymore. We're gonna, that's going to be. We have something to look forward to. That's your inheritance. That's your inheritance. Here's the, here's the fourth thing. And it really is an extension of the third. And that is that God offers us freedom. 
Look at verse 21. Well, first, verse 20, against its will, like, not all creation wanted to have this rotten situation. Like, the trees didn't do anything wrong. You know that? I've never seen a, a river otter misbehave. I've never seen a, a, a ladybug disobey God's word. It was not its fault. It's our fault. It's people. And so it says, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation, which includes who? Us, right? The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Oh, amen. <laughs> amen. What this is telling us is that when you said yes to Jesus, Ephesians 1.13 said, when you bowed your knee to Jesus and accepted him as Lord and Savior, his Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. And so things have changed. Absolutely things have changed. You actually have someone in you leading you, um, influencing you, begging you, guiding you, at least trying to, waiting for you to listen. But you have that now. But, even though you have that, it's not all good. Am I alone? It's not all good. We're honest, right? We still have aches and pains. We just talked about it. Do you know my mattress is like a Sealy or a server? It's only four years old. It's already, like, I can see my butt in it. That's a broken world, right? I didn't buy a Walmart mattress. I got totally ripped off. It's a broken world. It's a broken world. But someday it's going to be different. Someday all that we hope for will come true. There is a day when there will be no more sorrow and no more pain and no more tears and no more death. No more relational strife. No more money problems. No more cancer. No more nothing that's bad. Everything is going to be good. And it says that we have a hope. And when the Bible talks about a hope, it's a confident expectation because of two things. One, we look back and we see what God has done. We see that he made some promises and he kept them. We saw in the scriptures how he delivered the, the nation of Israel at the Red Sea. We saw how when people were hungry by the thousands, he fed them. We saw when there was a demon-possessed man, he cast him out. We saw when someone was dead, he raised him to new life. We see all that God has done, and so now we can look back and go, you know what, because I've seen him deliver on his promises, I know that he's going to take care of me now. We also have that confident expectation because we've been given a glimpse at the end of the movie. So we know the ending. And so we don't have the stress when the scenes of the movie come up because we already know the ending. Mother says in the time. If you're a sports fan, you know that when you watch the game, all of a sudden, you're screaming at the TV because the referee has just blown an obvious call. Amen. Like you're sitting on the couch, and the, the guy sitting on the couch who can't even hit the laundry basket with his pants, all of a sudden he knows how to make a play at the end zone. Like how to make the call. Oh, he was in, he was in! Bad call, bad call! He's screaming at the TV like a raving loon, right? Am I the only one who does this? You guys are like sitting there looking at me like, he's such an idiot. What? I never did that. I can make my pants in the You just choose not to, or? So that gives you permission to scream at the TV. Yes. Okay. Well, listen, right? Now, the big Gator fan. So if you're watching the game live, or if you're watching it at home while it's happening live, you'll, you'll go on a rant over the ref over a bad call, right? Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. But if you already know that your team won, and you're just going back to watch the video, when, when the bad call comes, are you going to, it's me, we're down, it's me, we're down, I can't believe they blew that call. Gator fans 
might still. Yeah. No, yeah. right? Would you do that? Because you already knew that your game, your team won 21 7. So is there any sense in screaming at the ref because of a bad call? No. So, so that's what it is with us. We already know the end of the game. We already know that God's team wins. We already know that we're going to be with Him in glory. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what your Red Sea looks like, you already know that He's going to deliver. So we don't have to get all fired up and have to go on a rant and freak out. So we, we know that we've been given that day when it's going to be better because we got a glimpse of the movie ending. We got a glimpse of the end of the game. You see, God has chosen through Jesus Christ's death on the cross to reconcile all of creation back to him. And that includes you. You know without a shadow of a doubt that it's going to be good at the end. Your team is going to win. So there is a day that's coming, and we need to rejoice in that. The present problems now, the suffering you have now, pales in comparison to the glory that you're going to share with them someday. Do you know what I'm saying? And so when you be thinking about this kind of stuff, fixing your eyes on the realities of heaven on Christ who sits on the throne at the right hand of the Father, and you know that you're going to rule and reign with Him, why would you ever be like freaked out over the stuff today? Like, listen, I'm not saying I graduate because I freak out a lot with you. But we can do better, right? We can do better. We need a revolution in our thinking. We need a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo of the way we think when we look at stuff. It shouldn't freak us out anymore because when I'm looking at the stuff, we're looking at the end of the game where I'm going to reign with Jesus and it's okay. It's all good. He's got my back. Do you see what I'm saying? We need to change the way that we think. And so there is a day where you're going to be free from all the troubles of this world, but in the meantime, we need to change the way that we're thinking, because here on this earth, we've also been given some freedom. As a result of what Jesus Christ does on the cross, we have freedom in a lot of areas. We have freedom from the law. You don't have to live by the letter of the law. You know what? If you live by the letter of the law, that's fear. That's fear when I got to do every single thing that this thing says, all 613, and I can do them right, and I can do them on time, in the right style, in the right way, in the right... On the... Who needs that pressure? And, and God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to worship Him by the Spirit. He's going to talk to you, and you go, like, yes, Dad, I'll do that, because I love you. You just do it. Not because you have to do it, because you want to. That's a big difference. Who wants their kids to do it out of fearful obligation. Like, that's a great way to start to get something done, but yeah, but wouldn't you rather have them want to do it because they just love you so much? I mean, it's, it's a good theory. But wouldn't that be great? Why do you think you want that? Well, could it be because that's what God's put inside of you? That that's what he wants of his kids? To do as he says only because you love him? Because you think back about the gospel, you think back of this undeserved kindness where he's placed you in the heavenly realms with him. And one day you'll, you'll judge the angels, you'll judge all of the worlds alongside with Jesus. And the Bible says that he loves you as much as he loves his son Jesus Christ. Now in response to that, you just do as he says, because you love him. We've also been made free from, the, from eternal death. This eternal death sentence that every human being has because of our, 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 our sin nature that's been put inside of our DNA from the moment of conception. We are all sentenced to an eternity separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. But God made a way so that you don't have to suffer that consequence anymore. And so you've been freed from the destiny that sin has placed upon you. You've been freed from that. Galatians 5.13 tells us another that we are free to serve in love. What, what, what does he mean? See, a lot of people take that freedom and they, instead of exercising it, they exploit it. You see, that, that's what people do. They exploit the freedom. See, in this country, we're fed a lot of lies. In this country, we are, we feel like we need to accumulate stuff for ourselves. Gather, 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 gather. But see, that's not the Bible's pattern. You know, way, way back in the Old Testament, when, when, when God blessed Abraham with lots, 
you know what he said? He didn't just bless him just to, to give him some so he could go, hey man, life is good, man. Look at God's done for me, man. Check this out. Look at this Mac Daddy 10. Like that's not what he did. He said, I'm going to bless you. Why? So that you can be a blessing. So he, he didn't give you, he didn't bless you in a variety of different ways so that you could just stand back and go, man, isn't God good to me? You see, Paul knew this too. He, 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 he recognized the same pattern. He recognized it. over in Galatians 1.15, it says, Paul says, you know what? God was pleased. God was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what it says. He, he, didn't, he didn't convert him so Paul could go, whoo! <laughs> Woo! And I've been killing all these Christians like crazy. I deserve to go to jail. I deserve to die. Go to hell. Man, I was good. <laughs> now, see, that's not why he saved them. See, Paul realized that he had been blessed. Why? To be a blessing. And, and, and so you're gifted by God, not for your own enjoyment, although we are to enjoy the things that God does. But one of the best ways we can enjoy what God has given us. So if we're gifted, it's to be a gift to other people. And so what Paul's telling us here is he's trying to give us a new reality. A new reality. See, our old reality was this, that we live to gain stuff, that we need to gain an education, we need to gain a spouse, we need to gain some children, we need to gain a car, we need to gain a profession, we need to gain some hobbies, we need to gain, we need to gain, we need to gain, we need to accumulate stuff, and that's going to make us happy. Self-indulgence. Hopefully, we're going to retire someday where you can gain enough money. But that's not why God blesses you. He blesses you so you can give it away. So that more people will receive it. See, He likes when you do say, hey, God's good to me. Ooh, you're good. See, He loves that. See, the thing is, he wants more people to do that. He gets off on that. That's his thing, right? So when he does it for you, he wants you to give it away so they can go, yeah, God's good. Let me tell you about what he can do. And then you can go, yeah, God's good. Let me tell you what I can do. And God's good. And then meanwhile, every single person is going, yeah, God's good, God's good. And now he's going, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I was shooting for. I didn't want just Jared to be happy. I wanted everyone he knows to know me and tell me I'm great. That's what he wants. We're a gift to be a gift. So this idea of freedom, listen, freedom and provision go hand in hand. Do you understand? These two gifts, these residual effects from the gospel, they go hand in hand. And what he's telling us here is we shouldn't believe the lies of this culture, but that freedom... To spend your life, to pour out your life in the service of God by blessing others only works with the Creator's promise to provide for those who go all in. That's the only way it works. You've got to trust in Him and go for it and give it away. And then, then we are free to operate as you've been designed. So the way we're operating now in this country, that's just not out the way we were designed. To accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. We were designed to be like Him. And what does God do? Give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away. Sacrifice my life, sacrifice my comfort so that others might do. That's the example of Jesus Christ. That's the way he wants us to be. He's given us freedom to approach him, the unapproachable one, and curl up on his lap. Tell him your worries. Tell him your cares. Tell him your frustrations. Share with him your doubts. Share with him your victories. Tell him everything that's going on in your life so you can feel close, so you can feel loved, so you can feel safe. That's what he wants for you. See, that's the daddy that you have in heaven. It may not be that daddy that you've had on earth, but that's the daddy you have in heaven. That's the daddy that will be with you forever. 
That's the value that will never leave you never see you. And that's the value that we, as men, should strive to be like. He gives us a new identity. He breathes courage into you. He prepares a priceless inheritance. And then he frees you. He frees you from the letter of the law, from guilt and shame, Someday, everything you had all for. The stuff that you go, you do this thing. I'm going to ask the men who are going to pass up to you to come forward. And we're going to take these elements together as a family. But in the meantime, I'd just like you to think about this. And then we're going to close in prayer.